worship together. Were creation suddenly articulate? Where the thousand tongues to lift one cry, then from north to south and east to west, we hear Christ be magnified. Were the whole earth echoing His eminence? His name would burst from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountain tops. We hear Christ be magnified. Oh, Christ be magnified. in me oh Christ be 
magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Amen. Amen. What a great truth to begin with this morning that we would cry out to the Lord that Christ Jesus would be magnified in our lives this morning. I don't know about you, but sometimes I wander in here on Sunday mornings and I'm just carrying a lot. There's a lot that's going on in my life outside of this place. There's a lot of things that are weighing on me, that are stressing on me. And it's such a good reminder to come together with the people of God, with the church, to encourage one another, to sing songs like that, to say nothing else, everything pales in comparison to what Christ is doing in our lives. And that he would be the one who would be glorified. He would be the one who would be lifted up. He would be the one who would be magnified. And nothing else would show. Our identity wouldn't be found in anything else but Jesus Christ and him alone. And the good news of the gospel is that Jesus knows these things that we bring in here. The things that we struggle with. The things that are weighing on us. The things that we're hurting in our lives. And he says, just give them over to me. I've already conquered them. And just rest my presence this morning rest in my goodness and in my grace amen you guys can be seated where you're at my name's Kyle I'm one of the pastors here and what a joy it is to worship with you each and every Sunday thank you for being here bringing your family here and um, I just pray that you would experience Christ in a powerful way this morning I know uh, you might be a visitor with us you might be a guest and I just want to say thank you for coming I hope you got one of these announcement cards and uh, you can see what's coming up in the life of our church also I hope you'll stop by our welcome table on the way out we'd love to give you a gift and just get to know you bless you uh, see how we can care for you or pray for you well Um, but this is a family this church is a family and we gather together like this each and every week uh, for one purpose and that's just to lift high the name of Jesus and so if that's a little bit foreign to you I just hope that you'll peer in today that you'll be open and receptive to how the gospel may want to infiltrate your life that Jesus wants to speak to you in a way that maybe you've never heard this morning and I hope you'll be open and receptive to that on your card here you'll see a couple of things coming up in the life of our church one thing I want to point out is um, well there's two things I want to point out one on that's not on the card one that is the first thing is um, I just want to give a special thanks to our silver servants that's a group of seasoned saints which is what I call because I don't like to use the word seniors seasoned saints that got here yesterday and spent several hours cleaning the chairs that you're sitting in um, a lot of people had spilled coffee on them or they had gotten wax on them or whatever and so they took time out of their day and they cleaned our chairs they did a couple of touch-ups around the building and so I just want to say thank you to our silver servants uh, for making this campus more inviting uh, more comfortable for us to be here so thank you and if you see one of those make sure you thank them as well secondly we have some other work we're trying to accomplish outside of this room outside on our campus and so guys you'll see on the announcement card we have our men's breakfast and work day this coming Saturday on the 25th we'll be here at 8 a.m. we'll have a great breakfast cooked by our very own Rusty Cox that you will not want to miss. We'll have a time of devotion together and then we're going to work for a couple hours just doing some spring cleaning around our campus. So bring your power tools, bring your chainsaws, bring your yard tools and equipment and just come hang out, work side by side with the guy. It's a great chance to fellowship, to get to know other men and to serve our church together. So I hope you'll join us next Sunday. Let me pray for us and then we'll continue to worship Jesus this morning. God, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for what you're doing in this place, for how you've brought these folks here for a specific purpose this morning, for them to meet with you. I pray that your presence would be evident, that it would be here, and that, God, your Holy Spirit would just, um, just overwhelm us this morning. God, just as we, we sang, would you be magnified in our lives, and would it start here? Would you encourage us this morning? Would you challenge us this morning so that we might go out from this place and make much of you this week? So as we continue to sing, would they be true declarations of our hearts? Would we just worship you in spirit and truth? We love you. It's in your holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Church family, let's enter back into worship and let's be reminded this morning of the work that Christ has done in our hearts and in our lives. That it's not us, but it is he who works in us.
John 15 says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he, is, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. That's what we're singing. That's the hope of the gospel. That, um, that it is nothing that we can do. That we have to abide in Christ. We have to rest in knowing that it, he was enough and he is enough and he will always be enough. And a lot of times we walk in here and there's heavy things happening. There's, there's family problems. There's other things that just cause us to have some weight. And Christ says, hey, I'm here to comfort you in that my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Lean into me. And sometimes we come in here with a lot of joy. We come with a lot of things. Man, God has done some amazing things this week, and I'm so excited to what is, what is happening. And in that, Christ rejoices with you. And he's with you in good, and he's with you in bad. But it is he that does the work, and it is he that is walking with you through all of life. And if you're in this room and you haven't ever known that, you don't know that there's a God that loves you, maybe as we sing this next song, this is what like, the Christian life is. It is that we depend on Christ, not that we try to figure it out on our own or pull it our own, pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, but it is that we know that Christ is for us. He sent his son, and that he came and lived a sinless life, died on the cross, and rose three days later to defeat sin and death on our behalf, that we don't have to live in this anxiety of what life can bring, but we can live in the hope of the gospel, the hope of the good news of Jesus. So this morning, may we celebrate that as we sing, as we worship him this morning.
as I enter rest. Oh, I depend on you. Yes, I depend on you. For up here sometimes. You know, as we sing those words, teach me to abide, isn't that a helpful reminder um, that we need the Lord to help us to remember what is true and um, sometimes as we sing songs, sometimes they are... um, as Pastor Kyle says, declarations of our hearts. And sometimes they're prayers for help. We're just asking the Lord to help us, to teach us, to abide in him, to, to be reminded of what is true, um, to anchor us in our faith. I'm so grateful for the chance to be able to worship together and be reminded of that. This morning as we continue in our study in the book of First John, If you want to open your Bibles to chapter 5, we're going to look at um, what a gift of faith is, a faith that believes, and the strength that comes from that belief. Uh, My name's Ryan. If I haven't had a chance to meet you before, I see a few new faces as I scan the room and recognize I'm not sure I know you. I'd love a chance to do that. Um, At the end of our service, I'll be right down front. Would would love to say hello to you and um, greet you, get to know you a little bit. Um, So please um, come forward. Um, 
We are, as I said, continuing in our series in 1 John. Um, we have one more week. Um, if you're curious, I always like to try to keep you updated. Um, uh, one, of, uh, one of you said, hey, how many more weeks are we going to go in this? And I said, I think it's going to be two. I promise, or I think uh, not more than three. So we've landed on two. Um, and uh, so we'll finish uh, 1 John, the book of 1 John, uh, next week. <clears throat> Two weeks ago, we looked at 1 John chapter 4, we finished chapter 4, and John's um, reminder to us, um, the exhortation to remember uh, to love and the call to love one another. And if you have not been with us uh, before, if you're a guest um, with us, again, I want to say just thank you for joining us. We're so glad that you would worship with us. But what John is addressing here in this uh, letter uh, to a group of churches, it would have been circulated around. He is dealing with a false teaching that has come into the church that has caused the church to have some questions and some doubts over what is true, what is true Christianity. And so we even have asked ourselves, we've been able to ask ourselves the question, how do I know, how can I be sure that I know Jesus, that I'm a Christian? Um, the reason for this is that the false teachers, um, known as Gnostics, they were teaching a false message that essentially could be summarized in this way, that all of flesh, all of sort of the natural world is always evil. The spiritual world is the only kind of realm which can be holy or can be redeemed, and those two things can't come together. <clears throat> and because of that, because of their belief in that, you can see that if Jesus, if God came to dwell with us, with man, that would be a problem because God would be taking on flesh, would be taking on what is evil, and so God and evil would be joined together. And they taught that they believed that wasn't possible. And so they denied the incarnation. They denied that Jesus actually came in the flesh. Of course, with that denial came future denials or sort of denials that would flow out of that, one of which was that Jesus couldn't have gone to the cross, could not have died on the cross, therefore he could not have atoned for sin. And so there's this unraveling that comes and that John very clearly, he wants to deal with that and he wants to shoot that. He wants to make it very clear to all of us that Jesus did come and he did a work. He did a powerful work of redemption on the cross on our behalf and that we can have confidence to know that. We can, we can know what is true. I will come back to this. You don't have to go to the slide on it yet. At the very end of this message, in verse 13, you're going to see I, John say these things. I write these things to you who believe to the church in the name of the Son of God, that you may know, that you may know and have eternal life. That is John's aim in this letter. And so as we come to chapter 5, he has just dealt with one of the tests that he gave the church that you would love one another. God is love, and if you claim to know God, then you know what love is, and therefore you would love one another. He's now going to transition to a second test, which is that you would believe, that you would have faith. As he does this, beginning in chapter 5, he's going to connect the line of thinking here. He's going to kind of connect the dots to our love and our faith and what that looks like. So I'm going to read from 1 John chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Would you please stand out of reverence for God's word? Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father, whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater for this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his son. Whoever believes in the son of God has this testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. 
Lord Jesus, I pray that you would bless the reading of your word. And as we read and study your word, would you help us all to know? Would you give us the gift of your grace, which is a confidence, a confident faith that believes and knows that we have eternal life. And because of that, the striving and the trials of this world, where they become less, not less painful, not less hard, but will we recognize them for what they are and realize that one day they will be no more. And with that confidence, sustain us through them, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So John is testified to the reality that we must love one another if we are going to claim to know God, if we claim to be Christians, that the overflow of that would be that we would love one another. And as he continues this thread, beginning in chapter 5, as I said, he is going to land this on this idea of belief. But he intertwines them. He helps us to see how belief, our faith, and love come together. And then essentially how the love of God leads us to even strengthening our faith. He says in verse 1, I write these, excuse me, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. Essentially, he says, everyone who believes, there's this faith there, this belief in Jesus has been born. And so we know that if we love God, that we've been born of God. Now, if we believe in that Jesus is the Christ, we've also been born of God. And if we love God, then we will also love those that he has also raised to life, those who have been born of him, one another. Belief and love are inseparable, John says. These two things can't be separated from one another. We can't say that we believe this and don't love, or we can't say that we love, but we don't believe. Those two things in the Christian life come together. It is the belief or the faith in Christ that has made us children of God. We are raised to life in Christ through our faith, through our belief that what Christ has done for us has been enough. We can't rightly love God if we then don't love the others who have also, like us, been born of God. The other way of saying that also is if we love God, we will love those born of God, one another. If you've struggled to love others, look at your faith. Examine what you believe. Because I would suggest that more than likely, if you've struggled to love others, there is some roots of pride that exists there. And the love that is lacking is rooted in the the, the thought or the forgetfulness that those others who you might be struggling to love have been born of God. And you have the same weakness that you needed to be born of God. You needed to be raised to life. See, when I look at others and perhaps there's weaknesses or things that are challenging for them and I think there's maybe it's an annoyance or a frustration or, or whatever that might look like. I remember my own need for Christ. I am the chief among sinners, Paul would say. I needed Christ. Without Christ, I would be nothing. So why would I look at anyone else and not realize that in the same way, without Christ, we are nothing, but with Christ, we are brothers and sisters. That's why when he says that we should love one another, he connects, he's connecting this to our faith. If we really believe that the only source of our life is Jesus, that we can't look upon others with any sort of condemnation. We can't look upon others with any sort of, uh, you know, looking down our nose at them, thinking of less than them. All we can do is look at others and see the need for the grace of Christ because we understand the grace which we have also first received. Belief and love are deeply intertwined. And, of course, we can't love one another if we don't know one another. This is what he says in verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God. This, this is how we know we love one another, the church. We do this as we love one another and we love God. We love God and we keep his commandments. See, the Antichrist, they were claiming, by the way, to love. They didn't deny the, the calling or the commandment of Jesus to love, but they couldn't love because they didn't rightly keep his commandments and they didn't obey and they didn't first believe. Whatever they claimed to love, whatever they claimed to believe was a lie. How could they love one another when they didn't really believe that they were children of God, that they had been born of God? It's only because of our belief 
that we're able to know one another. We're able to know that we are co-heirs with Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ. And as we are brothers and sisters in Christ and brought together as a family, we are able to love one another. This, by the way, is just one example of many in Scripture that helps us to illustrate the point of why it's important for us to be committed to a local church. Um, This evening, we'll have our City Church 201 class. If you're not familiar with that, that is a class that we host to allow you to take a step of joining with us in ministry here, to become a covenant partner or a member of this church. It's at 5 o'clock. We'd invite you to be a part of that. You don't have to be a member if you go to the class, but if you want to be a member, you got to go to the class. Did you catch that? That was really fastly said, but I want you to keep up. All right? And so I'd love for you to be a part, but here's why we do that. We need to know you. I need to know that you are my brother or sister in Christ so that I can rightly care for you and so I can spur you on in the faith and strengthen you and come alongside you and walk with you in this life. I have to know who my brothers and sisters are in order for me to love well. He then says, as he's continuing this thread, and forgive me for my voice, it is struggling. For this is the love of God in verse 3, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Now we're starting to get to the fruit of faith. If we love God, if we believe that we have been born again, we will love others, and then we will also, we will obey. We will keep his commandments. And the commandments, by the way, they're not burdensome. As Jesus said, my yoke is easy. We don't have to struggle with this, but let's just be honest. Isn't this so often where maybe ourselves have struggled or in conversations with our neighbors and friends, the Christian conversation is sort of starts to lose itself a little bit. Oh, so now you're going to tell me all the reasons that I can't do this and I can't do that, or these are all the things that I have. You have a list of rules for me to follow, right? Isn't that what we so often think of Christianity or sometimes the world sort of paints this caricature of us is that Christians have all these things that we must do, these rules that we must follow? Well, John teaches us that it is our love of God that produces obedience. It's not obedience that produces love, but it is love that produces obedience. And if we love God, then our behaviors will change. So no, friends, our message is not that you have to do this or don't do that. We don't have a list of rules for you to follow. What we have is a Savior for you to worship. And when you rightly love that Savior, your desires and your affections, John says, will change. Let me paint it for you in this way. If I invited you over to my home and just said, hey, I want to have you come over. But as soon as you walk in the door, say, hey, here's the deal, um, didn't preface this when I invited you to come over, but we're going to go ahead and have you stay three or four nights. Um, would appreciate if you just cook kind of all the meals uh, for, for that, just sort of handle breakfast and dinner. Um, wife likes her tea ready really early. She's a teacher, so if you just kind of have the, the kettle on. Um, it may happen. Uh, We've got a dog that's weird. There's some stuff that could happen. You might have to deal with that. <clears throat> Um, if there's a, anything related to a battery, I just would, you're just going to need to kind of take that on, just with changing it, you know, moving batteries around. If it involves a battery, it's it just going to ask if you would handle that piece for us. And, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't happen every day, but every now and again, you know, Laurel, she's a teacher, on her feet a lot. She just might need you to massage her feet, you know, so you could, if, if you would just take care of that. All we're asking. Cool. You'd look at me rightly like I was insane. And you would uh, about face and you're out the door. You're leaving immediately. No. But why do I do some of those things? Why do I get up and clean before the people that we've asked to come help us clean, clean again? (laughs) Why do I do those things? Because I love my wife. It's a way for me to serve my wife. It's a way for me to lay down my life for her. There's a few things that she just, I know, help her. Because I love her, there are things that I do that I don't really enjoy. That aren't always my favorite thing, but there is a sense of joy and just an obedience in that because of my love for her. There's a change. Because I love her, I do different things. When we love God, there will be behaviors that become natural for us. Things that seem a little strange, maybe even out there to most people, they become our regular way of being, 
Our desires and our affections are changed by our love for God. And here's the cool thing. You know, we can't measure our love for God. It's like when I would ask my boys, do you know how much I love you? Or they might ask me, Daddy, how much do you love me? How am I going to tell them that? From as far over there to as far over there, that's how much I love you. And you just keep going that way and just keep going that way. And they still can't comprehend it. They're grown men now, and every time I'm with them, I'm like, can I just please express to you how much I love you? They get to, uh, that's why I hug on them and I kiss on them, and they're 20 years old, 20, 19. They, they, I know it annoys them. I, I can't express it. Do you know how we can express our love for God, how we demonstrate our love for God? John gives us two tests. By the way, that we love others and then our obedience to keeping his commandments. Because of our belief in who he is, we love God. This is how we measure And here's the gift. He says that we don't just keep these commandments, which are not going to be burdensome. Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. Children of God will overcome the world by faith. Through our faith, we have victory over the world. You know, as you hear those words, victory, and a faith that overcomes the world, there's clearly a tone of conquest here. John is saying to us, in spite of what you see, John is an old man. He's lived most of his life persecuted for his love for Jesus, persecuted for his love for the church, persecuted for his obedience to God's commands. And he's saying to the church, take heart. Our faith will sustain us. John was in the room when Jesus taught taught him, promised him in a sense, You're going to have troubles. They're persecuting me, John. Don't you think they're going to persecute you? And at the end of that passage in John 16 in the upper room where Jesus is talking to his disciples about the persecution that's surely coming for them, Jesus tells them, I have said these things to you, John 16, 33, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace, that you would have peace. I have said to you, You're going to be persecuted, you're going to be attacked, you're going to be mocked, you're going to be judged, you're going to be thought as strange, you're going to, there's going to be, there's going to be an unending litany of things that will come against you in this world. And I've said all of this, I'm telling you all this, so that you'll have peace. Why? Where could that peace come? In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We need to be people who recognize what Christ has done, that he has overcome the world, and in him we too have overcome the world. Now sadly, the prosperity gospel and the teaching of that has crept into our culture in all sorts of different ways, and one of the ways, even within the church, is to us to equate that to the fact that we always win, that we always will have victory over this life, that, that, that this life is always about getting ours. We miss the words of Jesus if we think that's what he's saying here. He is saying, this world is not meant to satisfy you, friends. This world is not what it is about. I have overcome the world. I've had victory over the brokenness, the sin, the death that this world brings. I've overcome all of that. And through me, you too have overcome the world. This world no longer is your home. He's teaching us that we live constantly, permanently, until he comes again or he calls us to himself. We live as exiles. We've overcome the world in the sense that this is not what we look for. We don't look to be victorious always here. See, we need to have that kind of faith that believes that. That kind of faith strengthens us, gives us hope in the face of all of the various trials that we, we encounter in this life. He then says in verse 5, Jesus came that you may believe, be born again, and overcome. Who is it that overcomes the world? Except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. You can hear the direct attack against the false teachers who said that Jesus wasn't the son of God, that Jesus did not come and take on the flesh, did not lay down his life on the cross. It's those of us who believe in the son of God, who have overcome the world and in spite of the trials can have hope. And how do we know? How can we be sure 
that our faith is in the right place? Well, John gives us four tests. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to run through these rather quickly. But in verses 6 through 11, he explains this. This is he, Jesus, who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree. So he says to us, this Jesus who you've believed in, it's not just that you have believed in him, but that he is the real Son of God. And you can trust the testimony. We have three testimonies. I'll tell you that this passage of Scripture is one of the most debated passages of of Scripture. Since the beginning of the church, people have tried to understand exactly what is John talking about here. We got water, we got blood, we got the Spirit. Seems a little strange. What's he dealing with here? Well, most have landed on this belief based on all of the teaching of John and his other letters, including his gospel. But the, the water, he says, the water is the one that the Antichrist didn't deny. Notice he says that, Not by the water only, but the water and the blood. Well, the water is representative of Jesus' baptism. At Jesus' baptism, the Holy Spirit descended and affirmed that he was the Son of God, that he was who he said he was. The blood is a symbolic or representative of Jesus' death, his sacrificial death on the cross for our sins. And so we have not just the testimony of the Holy Spirit, but we have the testimony of Jesus' life that he came, was baptized, recorded in history, not doubting that, that he laid down his life on the cross, recorded in history, not doubting that, that he rose from the dead. These are the testimonies that we have. And John is appealing to these testimonies to the church to say, you don't have to doubt this. The Antichrist didn't deny the baptism of Jesus because that was something that the flesh could do. But again, that he could die on the cross, that his blood could atone for sin, that was what they denied. And so that's why he's pointing to that here. We have the testimony of the water, his baptism, the testimony of his death on the cross. And third, we have the Holy Spirit who affirms and tells us that this Jesus that we've put our faith in is true. And that we can have confidence in that. Finally, he gives us a fourth testimony when he says that we can believe in God. In verse 9, if we receive the testimony of men about his baptism, about his death, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his son. Whoever believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. Four testimonies. Jesus' life, his baptism, his death, the Holy Spirit of God, and God the Father himself says, Your faith is in the right place. You can believe. Believe in him. And in verse 10, he assures us that God cannot lie. If this was false, that would make God a liar. You know, one of the most beautiful things about last weekend when we celebrated Baptism Sunday, and I hope that you'll take this to heart for your own life, 25 people, testified to what Jesus had done in their life. They said, I believe in Jesus. I know Jesus. I know what he's done for me. And that testimony, their testimonies, your testimonies, our testimonies cannot be argued with. Some people might say, I don't believe in that Jesus, but they can't argue with what you know to be true, secured by the power of the Holy Spirit of what Jesus has done for you. You can have confidence in that. Confidence that your faith is in the right place. And why does John say all this? 1 John 5.13. I write these things to you who believe. I write these things to you, church, who already believe. You know this is true. In the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. See, one of the hardest things for us in this life is to really believe that often quoted verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son and that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. We've heard it. We've seen it quoted. Tebow's had it on his eyes. We, we see it all over the place. 
But to truly believe that changes everything. And John wants the church to know that their faith is in the right place. And that faith will sustain them. When they face the trials that this life will surely bring because Jesus promised that this life was not going to be all sunshine and roses. It is our faith that sustains us and it gives us assurance that yes, I do know God. I know God and I know that I will have eternal life with God. What's the worst that they can do? They can kill me. To live as Christ, to die as gain a freedom and a joy in life that will sustain you and carry you until you see Jesus is to know that you believe and you know that you know that you know you have the gift of eternal life, not because of what you have done, but solely on what Christ has done for you. This is what we celebrate this morning as we're prepared to receive communion. Last weekend, I shared as we celebrated baptism that Jesus gave the church two ordinances. The first ordinance of baptism is where we have the opportunity to come before the church, become before the world, and say to the world, I am a Christian. I have put my faith in Jesus. I believe this about Jesus. I believe that he is the son of God. And because I believe this about him, I know that I will have eternal life with him. When we come to the Lord's table, the second ordinance that Jesus gave us, It's a sweet gift where we get to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross and we get to tell ourselves, remind ourselves and tell the world, I'm still a Christian. Baptism, I am a Christian. Communion, I'm still a Christian. I still believe that this is true. Jesus has has held me on for one more week. So we come to the Lord's table. We're remembering what Jesus did. That his body was broken His blood was shed so that we could have eternal life. He loved you so much that he came to lay down his life for you. And that's what we remember. So whatever trials we face this week, the hardships of life, we come and we remember because of what Jesus did, I can't die. This body they may kill, the truth abideth still. I'm going to see Jesus one day. I'll be with him. And I can have a confidence in that. Church, we get to come to the table and remember that. If you're a guest here this morning, perhaps you're not sure about Jesus. First of all, thank you for having the faith to step into this place that I know probably feels and looks a little foreign to you. But rather than coming to the table where we are coming as brothers and sisters in Christ and remembering what what he has done for us, the Bible would instruct you to ask the Lord, if you have doubts still, don't be ashamed of those doubts. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm I'm so thankful that you're here. But as we come to the Lord's table, just bow your head and take one more step of faith, would you? And would you ask Jesus to show himself to you, to reveal himself to you in a, in a new way, whatever the, the doubt, the hurt, the pain, the confusion, whatever is there that's sort of gotten in the way of you believing and having a confidence that you know Jesus and therefore have eternal life, spend this time asking him, take a step of faith and say, I don't really know, even know who I'm talking to right now, but I'm going to ask you if you're real, come and speak to me. And I believe because he's spoken to me before, not audibly, but he's spoken to me through his word and through others and through prayer. He will speak to you. He will reveal himself to you. So spend this time doing that. Just some brief instructions. Um, Our elders are gonna serve the table. Um, They'll serve the bread here at the wings and then you'll come forward for the juice and go back this way. So we're gonna have the wings each to my left and right. You guys are gonna come first just as the, the spirit leads. You can just get up and come. You'll come this way and everyone will go through the center aisle back to your chairs. After the outsides have gone center, folks, then that'll be your opportunity again. If you'd exit on the outsides and come through the center um, to receive the elements and then we'll take communion together. Um, If you need gluten-free communion, we have that available to you. You just need, when you get to the bread, you can just skip right over. You get to just the fast pass right to gluten-free and uh, you can come grab your elements here and then return to to your chairs. Lord Jesus, thank you. 
for what we know to be true, that we have eternal life, not based upon our performance or our own ability or who we are, but solely based on your finished work on the cross as we come now and receive from your table this reminder of your broken body, your shed blood. Would you strengthen us in our faith, spur us on, carry us forward. And for anyone in this room who is unsure of who you are, Jesus, I ask, I plead, would you speak to them now? Would you let today be the day of salvation as they seek you, as they ask questions of you? Help us as a family just to surround them with your love and grace, we pray in Jesus' name.
I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe in the Holy Spirit Our God is three in one I believe in the resurrection That we will rise again For I believe in the name of Jesus Counts what he received from the Lord to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your death, but also your resurrection and the promise that you will come again. Thank you for the gift of faith that we can know because of you and you alone, we have eternal life. Because of you, we can know that you will come again. You will wipe away every tear. You will turn our mourning into dancing. You will finally complete making all things new. Thank you for the hope that we have. I pray that we would live with hope today because we know. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. We love you guys. Hope you have a wonderful week. Look forward to seeing you soon.